Honorable Senator, please be seated. <clears throat> At the brief adjournment, Senator Bowen had completed his contributions, and I think now it's the turn of uh, Senator Glenn Noel, in that order. Senator Glenn Noel. And as I indicated, you would have my discretionary 15 minutes um, if you need it. But I would also draw the attention of all senators to um, standing order 33-7. And again, I would exercise my discretion in your favor. Senator Noel. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Chair, Deputy President. I rise to give my unwavering and unconditional support to the Appropriation Bill 2012, or the estimates of revenue and expenditure for the year 2012, as presented by the Minister for Finance, the Honorable Nazim Buck, in the House of Representatives on the 9th of March 2012. Mr. Deputy President, the theme chosen for this year's budget, consolidating the recovery and advancing the transformation agenda is very appropriate and indeed relevant. Given our current economic situation, Mr. Deputy Chair, economic growth is undoubtedly our most urgent and unpostponable need since it is the prerequisite for sustainable and economic development. Mr. Deputy President, despite the opposition attempt to undermine the credibility of the budget, I wish to, as I said in the beginning, give my profound support for the budget. And we will agree that the theme that we have chosen speaks about the government's concept of recovery. Recovery is a process. It is not something That is an end in itself. It begins, and what we are speaking about is consolidating this recovery. So we are not saying that we have recovered and that everything is okay. So for those who are proposing this notion, this is not our notion. When we speak about consolidating the transformational agenda at the sectors. It speaks about the government being very cognizant that in order to ensure sustainable economic growth and development, there must be some long-term planning. We must prioritize, we must identify the sectors that will be responsible for that transformation. And therefore, we have identified those sectors. I have not heard any challenge from the opposition side to see that the sectors that we have identified cannot take us to the path that we want to go. I have not heard them say that this is not the right roadmap. So it seems as though there is a consensus that the government has chosen the sectors that if the proper investment is made, if these sectors are nurtured properly, if we invest in them in the long term, they can transform this economy. They can make it more diversified, more dynamic, more resilient, and less open to external shock. I want to believe we all agree that this is so. And therefore, the budget in itself 
is part of the government's overall developmental plan. And while you may cater for a particular year, it is part of a, a process. And therefore, there is a philosophical basis for, for it. And as it states clearly, it is an estimate, an estimate of revenue and expenditure, meaning that there is some level of, it is relative. It doesn't mean it must be a guess in abstraction. But there are many things within this process of the recovery that you may not be able to predict. We can have another hurricane, and it may set us back. We'll have to take those things into consideration. So I think after listening to the opposition's contribution, generally, there are two points that it seems to labor on. One, the concept that the recession is over. And secondly is, the secondly, is the financing gap. Let me say a word or two about this concept about the recession is over. You get the picture when you listen to them that they expect that as a result of the 1.1% growth, that it now means that jobs will be provided for everybody. That this 1% will reach the whole community at the same time. We often say tourism is everybody's business, everybody's business. And this is a tourism. But it doesn't mean the man who is unemployed, and so he may directly say, well, I don't see what tourism has to do with me because I'm working directly in the tourist industry. I'm not receiving a dollar on a, on a, and I'm unemployed. But tourism is everybody's business because it helps, is a sector that is important for the development of the economy and it contributes heavily in terms of foreign exchange earnings. And even though that individual may not directly feel it, but it has an impact on his life. So in the same breath, if you have had a one 0.1% growth in the year 2011. And in 2009, you experienced a, I think it was a 5.7 decline, negative growth. And then in 2010, you experience a 1.3 negative growth, and in 2011, you experience a positive growth of 1.1%. You're not ascending. You are improving. You are rising. If somebody puts you in, in, in a barrel, and they decide to bound you and cast you down into the sea, and you lose all hope because you're sinking, and suddenly you realize that they're pulling you up and you're rising, you begin to have hope. You have not surfaced completely. So it doesn't necessarily mean that everything is over, but you are coming up, you're not going down. So the concept of recession, where you, you have four, you had about six quarters of negative growth between the period of last between the period of 2009 to the last quarter of 2010. And then you will have had a so quarter of positive growth. So you're moving up. And when you look at the projection for 2012, where we expect between 1.5 to 2% growth, then it is fair to say to the people of Grenada that we have begin, begin a process of recovery and that we are not declining. And therefore, in the strictest economic terms, the recession is over. But it does not mean that we are not open to external shocks. It does not mean that we cannot have, a, 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 we cannot slip backwards if some 
unforeseen or other circumstances take place. So I want to give my support in my appreciation and understanding of what the minister said in the other place. And to say to the people of Grenada that I do not gather from that, that it means that everything is rosy and all of the problems are resolved. We, you look at the global financial situation and we look at our economy. Our economy is still very much dependent on tourism and, and we're still dependent to a great extent on um, remittance. We still ex depend on revenue from a few crops. And that is why we have identified those transformational sectors of the economy, um, tourism and hospitality, health, education, and wellness, agribusiness. We have identified the potential of the energy sector. And we have spoken the role that ICT has to play, would play, in the transformation of the economy. And we believe that if we continue that path and that plan, it will strengthen our base and at least help us to get out of this situation. That is the philosophical underpinning of the economic path that we have chosen. So in this context, I support wholeheartedly the efforts that are being made to transform the Grenadian economy. So we would not resolve every situation in 2012. The budget is not a complete statement of all our plans, Mr. Deputy Chair. But if you listen to the persons on the other side, at one time I had a difficulty in appreciating whether it was part of a play or whether it was a summons of doom and gloom. You know, as we were telling every Grenadian that we are about to die because this budget is going to kill us. There is no hope. But Madam President, sorry, Mr. Deputy Chair, if we look carefully at the budget, there are some areas that have come that will contribute and has contributed towards the development of this country. And I want to point out just a few of the positive things from the 2000 and 12 budget and based on the, the performance in 2011. Madam President, Mr. Deputy, <laughs> excuse me, our, the Senator who represent the private sector pointed out that the private sector do have seen areas of improvement, pointed out there, there are some areas that the government um, is embarking on that will bring some relief to the business sector. He spoke about the removal of the excise tax on the alcoholic, uh, alcohol based products for the manufacturing sector, and that is going to give them some relief. So, we're talking here about Noelsville, persons who produce essence. We're talking about all the persons like um, Baguna who produce pep wine. They are going to get a relief in the sense that they will be able to be more competitive as far as the print of their manufacturing goods. And that is a positive in the budget. They didn't mention that. They didn't see it. It's not important to them. He also pointed out that the rebate that the manufacturing sector receives will continue and is important as it relates to helping them. That is another important area. He pointed out that the government will continue to provide the 50% re removal on VAT on construction material 
and that is incentives for the construction sector. He also pointed out that the removal of VAT on government funded projects will enable the sector to grow and those projects to expand and give hope. This is a positive act of the budget. We look at, as it relates to agriculture, and we saw that there is an increase of 65% in terms of the money that is allocated to the farm labor support program. And we attributed the growth in the agriculture sector to a great extent to our traditional crops and the fact that the farm labor support program has helped the farmers to clear their plots and to collect their nutmeg and cocoa and so. We have invested in that area. We also pointed out that we recognize that ICT is an important driving force for the economy and we believe we could provide at least 2,000 jobs in that sector. He spoke about that. We have moved the whole issue of the island scholarship from two persons to five persons in five important sectors. That is an investment in the education of our people. The budget speaks about that. So this budget is not all this budget is not about doom and gloom. This budget is making contribution to many sections of our population. Mr. Deputy President, you yourself have campaigned and asked for the removal of VAT on funerals. You may say that it's late. You may say that it should have been done sometime earlier, but at least the government remove the VAT on coffins and let it not be said that what they have done is not to put a cap. There is a difference between a coffin and a casket and the price range is different and most coffins cost between $11,000. So we're not talking about somebody who wants to spend $25,000 on, on, on funeral, on a casket. So there is a cap that address the poor. So I think it's important to point out those aspects of the 2012 budget. I think it's extremely important for us to let our people know. And so there are many things that I can say about the overall situation. But bearing in mind that I have some responsibility to report on some very specific areas, I would look at my time carefully and now look at the various sectors. And I may return to some general points about the 2012 budget later on. Madam President, Mr. Deputy President, maybe I'm taking a little time getting used to you in the chair <laughs> on such an occasion. I would like to turn my attention to the Ministry of Housing, Lands, and community development. In 2012, the government has allocated 15 million three hundred and forty five thousand four hundred and one dollars to that particular ministry. The recurrent expenditure is two million five hundred and one thousand four hundred and one dollars and the capital expenditure is twelve million eight hundred and forty four thousand dollars. When we look at the 2011 performance of that particular ministry, see here that 114 persons benefited from the Grenada Home Improvement Program at a cost of just over $1 million. Of these beneficiaries, 
six persons were fire victims, and over $76,000 was spent in providing assistance to such persons, and they came from all over the island. We had, we had 13 persons we consider as special needs, and we spent $164,520.28 on these persons. And in addition to that, 95 persons received support from the house repair program at the cost of $772,046.48. Look at a breakdown of where the persons come from. We can see that the whole of the country benefited. But often, the number of persons that have benefited will depend on the conditions of the house in the particular constituency in terms of acute need, but sometimes to a great extent, the aggressiveness and the level of performances of the various housing officers. So we had in, in, in Kariaku, four persons, in St. Andrews, 32 persons, in St. Mark, four persons, St. Patrick's, nine, St. David, nine, St. George, 27, and St. John, 10. So these were the persons that benefited from the Home Improvement Program. Mr. Deputy President, the Chinese low-income houses are about to be distributed, and if everything go a plan, they should be distributed in the second quarter of 2012. What we are doing now is just finishing touches, installing the um, meter base, the electricity to the houses, water, and the sewage system. We have a system in place where there are persons from the community who has been identified from the respective community where the houses are built. We have persons from the NGO community, from the Ministry of Housing, and they would sit and do an interview with persons who have applied for these houses. It will be a difficult task because, for example, in, at Mongay, we have 180 units, but we have over 1,600 persons who have applied for the houses. And in Subiz St. Andrew, we have 153 units, but we have as many as 400 plus persons who have. And so it will be a task. But the good news is that we have set a precedent, a precedent of being fair and being objective and have a criteria that can stand the test of times to ensure that persons who are really in need of the houses will get the houses and the houses we have ended the days when things are distributed based on color. So in the distribution of these houses, it would not be NDC, NNP, green, yellow, but it will be the people of Grenada. And this is one thing we have brought to an end in Grenada. And sometimes when we look at the contribution that this government make, there are some valuable intangibles that we could talk about in terms of the new climate, a new atmosphere of Grenada working for all. Madam, sorry, <laughs> Mr. Deputy Chair, Mr. Deputy President, as we move along and we look at the situation as it relates to housing, one of the things we have recognized is that there were many persons. And there are some persons who got material as far back as 2007. And they have them hidden below the house because in those days, you got material based on the party that you support. And some persons were given no assistance in putting up these houses. So we recognize that there is a need to provide not just the material support, but to provide labor as well. So what we have decided is to organize house repair work brigade of at least four persons in a particular 
gang a brigade. And each UNC will have about three or four brigades. And they would identify, first of all, persons who have material and have not yet done repairs on their home. And secondly, persons who ought to benefit and are not capable, do not have the capacity to provide the labor, they will be given support to ensure that they are able to do that. And so that is the plan for 2012 as we move forward. In addition to that, we will continue with the Chinese low-income housing project. We have the other 647 units that we are looking to get work close to start in 2012. So far, we have budgeted $3 million for work on the sites. We have identified Diamond in St. Mark's, Mount Rose in St. Patrick's. We have um, Mount Delis in St. David. We also have Stan in St. John's. And we have not forgotten the sister isle of Karaku. And so we are going to begin work, working closely with our Chinese friends to begin development of those sites so that we could commence the rest of the houses. <laughs> Mr. Dep Mr. Deputy President, the Housing Authority of Grenada have been making strides too. Because many years ago, because of poor management and neglect, they have departed from the mandate and could not continue to provide affordable housing for the people of Grenada. In fact, it, many times they were dis they were disc by the previous government in terms of their mandate. But what we have returned to is the ability now to provide low-income houses. And so we have a house that is currently being built in Diamond for about $200,000, a three-bedroom house, concrete house for $200,000. When you look at the current commercial market, one can say that this is very affordable. And they will continue in this vein in the next few weeks and months ahead. <laughs> a a, a three-bedroom concrete house going for three and four hundred thousand dollars at this moment. Mr. Deputy President, I would now like to focus a little on the Community Development Division. And as we look at the Community Development Division, again, what has been done to this division is a reflection of the government's philosophy that we need to develop our infrastructure, we need to work with our people, we need to recognize that every one of us belongs to a particular community and we need to enhance our community. Some years ago, the Community Development Division basically lost its mandate. It was reduced to just two or so persons and the then Prime Minister, who wanted everything under his control. So he removed the housing program, and that was under the Prime Minister's ministry. Most of the work was done through special projects. What we have done is to restore that division and have a very dy dynamic division in the Ministry of Housing, Lands and Community Development. So in 2011, 95 projects were approved by that department. And in 2011, 53 of these projects were completed at a cost of $2,419,013.75. Mr. Deputy President, again, this government is a government that very much committed to overall development of Grenada. So you would not see projects only done in St. George's and not in, in the rural areas. And so all of the constituencies receive some project. 
in St. David's, we had nine projects approved because of the time constraint. I, I would not get into the names of all of the projects, but I would ask the media to use this opportunity to do the research and they can get the information and find out which are the communities in the different areas that receive support and were enhanced. So in St. David's, you had nine projects approved, flitted. In St. George's, in South St. George, eight projects approved, six is currently ongoing. In the town of St. George, you have six projects approved, three were completed. In St. George Southeast, you had seven projects approved, five completed. In St. Mark's, you have nine projects approved, five completed. And in St. Andrew's Northeast, and I think that is important to note. Let us note carefully, St. Andrew Northeast is a constituency where the parliamentary representative is a member of the opposition. Is a member of the opposition. And I know, and all of us know, that in previous time, a constituency that was held by the opposition would not have received its fair share of support. And I want to say not just its fair share, but 14 projects have been approved in St. Andrew Northeast, the constituency that is now held by the Honorable Minister Roland Bola. And out of this project, seven projects were completed. It shows that NDC is fair. It shows that NDC believes that Grenada must be a Grenada for everyone. And these are some of the changes that have taken place in this country that our people are now proud about. Even, even the parliamentary representative said he didn't expect it. Because he knows. Madam, Mr. Deputy President, St. Patrick's, when you consider East and West together, got 12 projects approved. And eight of these projects were completed. And that is the constituency of our Prime Minister. If the philosophy was different, you'd have seen nearly all the projects going in that particular area. But you have an opposition member have more projects approved in his area because we look at needs and we look at the community. In St. John's, we had four projects approved, but all of these projects were completed. And in St. Andrew, Southeast and Southwest, we had 14 projects approved, and seven of these projects are completed. Work at the community development level has a component where we encourage community participation and voluntarily labor, because it's important to get our people to recognize the value of contributing towards the country and economy. And many of them do so willingly once we provide the material. But in addition, apart from the big projects, because you may have the Granville Market Square project that may cost $35 million. And you may very well have only maybe 120, 150 persons overall being employed. But in the community related projects, where just over $2 million was spent, we were able to employ 480 persons, skilled, semi skilled, and unskilled persons. And what it means is that you have low spending but high impact in the sense that you enhance the community but you also provide jobs for people. That is a caring government. That is indeed a caring government. Mr. Deputy President, the other aspect of that ministry, lands, we saw 2011. 265 surveys been completed across the country in eight communities. I can safely say in St. George we had 109, in St. Andrew 95, and St. David but 51. We also saw 118 lots being sold 
for housing development and at least two lots were leased for commercial purposes. The issue of the lots that have been sold is that it gives ordinary persons, since the lots are sold to ordinary persons based on the need and income level. In other words, government lands are not intended to help persons who can buy at the commercial level at different places, but indeed for the very vulnerable who are struggling. And it gives them an opportunity to be empowered. They now can have title to a property that they can go to the bank and get a loan and improve their livelihood. So that is a very important and significant part of government's work as we move along. Mr. Deputy President, I would now want to move over to the issue of information and national mobilization. Mr. Deputy President, in October, when the, when the Prime Minister reshuffled the Cabinet and was given new responsibility as Minister of State responsible for information and national mobilization, if you ask me, would I have preferred to go into that ministry or to in housing, lands and community development, I would have said that I would have, been, I would have preferred to remain in housing, lands and community development. Why? Because I have seen the look on people face. I've seen people come to my office even threatening to commit suicide based on the need and the economic and social condition as far as needing some support as it relates to housing and lands. And there is a deep sense of gratification that you feel when you make a tangible contribution to the improvement of someone's life. You can feel it and you can touch it. But I'm a team player. I'm a team player. And I recognize that as a politician, as someone in this business, you must be multifaceted and you must be skilled and you must be able to perform under any condition in any area. And therefore, when I was given the opportunity, I grasped it because country comes first. And information is not a very tangible thing where you can feel and see, but it's a task that must be done. And so one of the things that we continue to do, because this is another area where this government has shown new positive area and have given much hope to the whole question of this new governance and involvement of our people and the freedom of information and freedom of expression. We have reorganized GIS. And it has become one of the many symbols of government openness and government good governance agenda. It really represents that in the sense that this current opposition has now organized 125 programs that is aired and viewed by all. A new course we have chanted that could have never happened before 2008. Before Liberation Day, July 2008, that could have never happened. Ah, huh? opposition? And GIS, because it was seen as the government is, is, is the current administration. You have no room for opposition. You give opposition opportunity. In fact, some people even condemn us and say we're foolish. And say this is poor politics. Why would you give the opposition access? It is in keeping with our philosophy. There is a role for the opposition. We believe that they too must have an opportunity to have their say. Well, give us at least a thumbs on the table for that. But you won't do that. Yes, yeah, something, 
You are now able to go to GIF and speak to the people of, of, of Grenada. Can everybody hear you? That couldn't be done before. And the, and the good news is that you ain't getting back there so you can't cut it off. <laughs> that is the good news. That is the good news. Mr. Deputy President, JS 24 Hours TV Channel 12 and 22 accommodates not only the government and the opposition, but indeed every sector of the society. We have seen live broadcasts of parliament, both chambers of the house, and that has been very consistent. The NGOs, civil society, all community groups, they now have access to GIS. And we have seen a lot of programs from the religious community, every group, every organization, now able to display the talent, including culture, and there is a new atmosphere of freedom. We are now moving to ensure that we have the Broadcasting Act before Parliament. And in this regard, we have set up a committee that is responsible for looking at the media policy that consists of persons from the Media Workers Association, um, individual private radio station, and television station, <coughs> and GIS. Let me say something in this regard, because there is a bit of mischief that is going around, accusing this government of wanting to stifle the press. As the new Minister for Information, I called the former chairperson, or the chairperson of the Media Policy Committee, and say to him, I would like you to continue. We are now in a stage where we are ready to proceed. The AG has perused the document. He has submitted it, and therefore, you must continue with your work. He said to me, I would need a couple of days and I will give you a response by the middle of next week. Lo and behold, by Monday, I saw in the media an article that suggests that the good chair has now resigned but that this is in shambles, the other persons are no longer interested. And what is more <laughs> important to observe is that the media really said that in trying to contact the chairperson of the committee for a response, he could not be found. But when you check the link of that information, that information itself comes from the chairperson. So he can't find himself. But he put out a release saying that the committee is no longer functional. The principal, after he would have made a pledge to provide some clarity whether or not he has an interest in continuing, by the middle of the week, without receiving such, there was this article that came. But this government recognized that not everybody that understands certain standards, and maybe th that is why some people may resist having a code of conduct for media workers. We just noticed, I just pointed out for information, because sometimes people spin things and you get the wrong information, but it's important to put the information in context. I also want to use this opportunity to speak on a very important development, because I will speak on it in the next coming 
this. And let me say this, that I have been on record for defending people's right. In the late 80s and 90s, I was viewed as a controversial person, a troublemaker, especially as it relates to culture, carnival and calypso, mainly because I was protecting the Calypsonians' right to perform the trade and craft and protect the freedom of expression. I was opposed to censorship and people trying to get them not to sing and keep them off by imposing judges who will keep them down. So having also participated in the trade union movement, one thing I could say clearly to the people of Grenada, I would never participate and I would never be part of any government. The salary that is given to me is not enough for me to be part of any regime that will seek to stifle and to muzzle the media. Now, everybody has some values, and even though you participate in a government, there is a point at which you have to say, this is what you would do and you would not do. And I could say that. I could say that because I could say that proudly and freely. And therefore, I would not be part of any government that seeks to do that. So the very notion, again, are responding to some mischief that has been made and suggesting that this government is intolerant and that this government is seeking to muzzle media workers. This is very far from the truth because you have my word that if this is so, I would not be here and will not continue. And I could see that unwavering without any hesitation because I know who I am and my value. And so in the next couple days, I will speak to some developments which I do not want to go into at this particular moment, but I would, I would uh, I lay this premise, I lay this premise to tell you who I am and what I believe in. And therefore, when you hear things from the spin team, you would know what is true and what is not true. But I will return to that later on. Madam, Mr. Deputy President, one of the things the government has done in the last few weeks and months is to make the best use of the opportunities and outlet that exists to promote the work of the government. In the past, we were criticized heavily for saying enough about what the government is doing. There is still a gap. There is still a lot of work to be done but we have made some serious strides to ensure that we're able to bring to the fore some of the good things that we have done. In recent times, we have not missed a single program on to the point which afforded us an opportunity for a government minister to be present. Under my watch, I've changed that. That used to be something sometimes you get somebody, sometimes you don't get somebody. Real FM Radio offers an opportunity on Wednesday morning for government ministers or people um, in the government, from the government, to get an hour. And that used to be a kind of ad hoc arrangement. Often, sometimes, one month will pass and no one will be there. So a lot of the opportunity are begging. Under my watch, I've transformed that and make that very systematic. So every Wednesday, you would have somebody from the government side being there to explain to the people what is happening and what has been happening. We have also consolidated on the work that Senator Gill began with you decide that every Wednesday, the last Wednesday of the month, 
a government minister has an opportunity to go to that particular media and able to speak to the Grenadian people. We have consolidated that, we have an arrangement, and that is so. In addition to that, again, I want to just address that briefly. I saw in the media various versions of it. It is no secret that we have some public relations officers attached to the various ministries. And many of them have done great work over the last year or so, but there is always improvement. There have always been the understanding in the same way like any other government official. You may have a policeman, today you see him in traffic, tomorrow you see him in maybe the court. Or you may see him in St. David's and tomorrow he's transformed to another part of the country. And so there's always this understanding that the PROs, they would move from one ministry, shadow another ministry. It helps to give them an understanding of what is taking place in the various ministries. We recognize that they have different skill and different talent. Some are good at writing, some are not very good at writing, others are very good at interviewing, others are not so good at that, others are good at reading, they can be good anchors. So what we have done is to find a way to integrate them and to merge the talent and to bring them under one ministry. In other words, I'm a decisive person. I take my responsibility very seriously. And obviously, I'm looking at getting a more effective use of the PR. And so under my watch, I've decided essentially that we will have them under one ministry. They'll be assigned there. The work is to the government and people of Grenada. They'll be assigned to various ministries, but they'll work as a team and those who can interview will continue to interview. Those who can read will read. That itself has been spinning in a particular way. But I just want to state what the truth is. But as a person, I'm always decisive in whatever I do. And I do it to the best of my ability without fear or favor. As it relates to the concept of yeah you have 10 minutes more on your allotted time and fifth more on your discretionary time thank you very much mr deputy chair deputy president mr deputy president the concept of the ministry of national mobilization what we do what is our vision what is our mission what we exist for. It is no doubt that any government must continue to engage the general public. And because the general public is not homogeneous, it means there are special needs and special interest groups, and we must respond to their need. And the same way the government recognizes that we have had a gap in information we recognize that we must strengthen the public engagement part and continue to have greater, give greater access to government to our people. And therefore, what we're seeking to do is to provide the opportunity for timely and regular engagement of the general public and very specific sectors. So, over the last few months, what we have done, we have consulted often with the private sector. We consulted with them on the matter of the Taiwan debt. We consulted with them on the GBL Tau issue. We have consulted with the trade union on several matters. We have consulted with the NGO community on several matters. And we are organizing a program where we will have greater outreach to our farmers, our fishermen, our taxi drivers, our bus drivers, and indeed the entire population. We also believe that we must rekindle that spirit of patriotism, of volunteerism, of bringing our people together and unifying them. 
And we believe that ministry can play an important role as a change agent. We also recognize that we need to mobilize our people around some national events and activities and to look for new ways of engaging our people. So if you examine very carefully, you will observe in 2012 that we had increased participation in our national independence celebration. And in collaboration with the Ministry of Culture, and I must congratulate Senator Gill on the work that they have done and the insight for the best village competition. But we're working very closely with them to get people more involved and to participate mainly on those activities. That is one of the work that we see ourselves doing. We look then like Thanksgiving, and if you notice, the last one that we had, you would have noticed that there were more persons in the audience than other times. And you saw the special interest group, our scouts. You saw um, our people in uniform being part of the church service. That is part of the new drive to get greater participation and involvement for our people in activities. Even indeed, one can say, as far as the budget presentation is concerned, in the presentation itself, compared to the past two years, the hall of field, and that is part of the greater effort to get more people involved. We expect to put in place a national emulation exercise where we will be able to identify the talent and skills and contribution of our people and have a national emulation ceremony. We put in place a National Heroes Day where we will, based on our legislation, identify who our heroes are and to use that day to celebrate with them and to get our people more aware about the contributions that our people are making. We expect to get in place a day of national volunteerism where we will encourage people, everybody, to make a contribution to volunteer. Could be a national cleanup day where all our people will participate. So there are a number of activities that we have planned that will engage our people and keep them involved at all levels. Mr. Dep Mr. Deputy President, I now want to move briefly to the area of agriculture, forestry, and fisheries. I think it is well acknowledged that despite difficulty, this sector is one of the flagship sectors for the economy in terms of its contribution. And we have seen in 2011 a 8.1% growth. We have seen $50.7 million in foreign exchange earnings. And that is that was a 30.1% over 2010. So that sector continued to do well. We have the Minister of Agriculture here. I'm happy that he's here, Honorable Dennis Lett. And I want to encourage you to continue your good stewardship over this sector because the government recognized that it will continue to be a main pillar of our economic development. And as we look at it and we add that aspect of agribusiness. It means that we're very much aware that we cannot continue to only export primary um, agriculture products, but we are importance of value to the primary product. As we look at the subsector performances, we can see that there was an increase in cocoa production from 1 million to 1.5 Point five million, an increase of over 500 pounds of 50%. And the earnings from that was $6.5 million in 2010, 2011, sorry, $1.4 million increase over 2010. We also saw that the Farm Labor Support Program rehabilitated just over 677 acres of cocoa. Mr. Deputy President, 
the opposition often say that we are taking all the credit for the growth in the sector and not giving them any. When we inherited the government in 2008, the farmers were demoralized. They were not motivated. The nutmeg and the cocoa was out there in the field. Vine covered most of the trees. The, one, the $17 million just after Ivan that was supposed to be used for the farmers to clear the field was mismanaged grossly. Many, many people got money and never entered the farmer field to clear it. People spoke about that. What you will see under this government, because of our commitment to a good governance, accountability, yes, you could laugh at it, <laughs> because it's, 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 it's something that is foreign to you. So anything that is strange is new. Mr. Deputy President, under this administration, what we have ensured of value for money and the money that was spent as far as the farm labor support program is concerned. And it motivated and encouraged farmers to go to the field to pick up the yield. So even though some of the plants that are now being harvested may have been planted before, but the fact is that if you couldn't clear it and you didn't have no hope and nobody wanted to go into the mountain, it didn't make any sense. So the issue of our contribution to this aspect must be seen in this light. And many farmers are saying today, thanks for the program. It has helped them tremendously. And it is a key factor that is responsible for the growth that we are experiencing. In the traditional crop sector, we have seen in the nutmeg, in nutmegs, our earnings in 2011 was over $11 million. Uh, an increase in production by a, about 116 percent. In fact, nutmeg production moved from just around a million pounds to well over 2,157,969 pounds in 2011. And we see increased price. So now farmers, farmers are feeling much more comfortable. In order to sustain that, we have entered into an intensive program as far as the propagation is of plants is concerned. So we recognize that we have to propagate much more plants to make plants available. And in fact, the Ministry of Agriculture they deem 2012 as the year of nutmeg other spices. It's important for us to maintain our name as the Isle of Spice because there are several countries that are competing with us now looking for the niche, want to call themselves the Isle of Spice. So we can't be the Isle of Spice and we're not investing in spices. Otherwise, sooner or later, we'll discover that other countries have taken that. In fact, earlier this year, there was a major shipment that we could not fulfill for thousands of pounds of cinnamon. And I myself have gotten involved on a voluntary basis to assist some farmers in finding market. And I can say to you that I've assisted two persons to find some earnings where they know First of all, the farmers. So they, 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 they purchase spices of the from farmers, and they now ship it to the United States, and it's sold over the internet all over the world. So we have people who are talented and committed, and they, they very much can fit in anywhere. Mr. Deputy President, although this year, the fisheries sector had a decline in growth. We are very much concerned. We are very much concerned about it because this is an important 
sector for the economy. And we are now looking into what are the reasons, research to tell us what are the problems. On the surface, overfishing on the near shore have been cited. Persons have suggested that we may need to work with the fishermen, the net fishermen, to look at the net so that the smaller catch um, can be spared. There are suggestions that environmental factors that has to do with the warming of the waters and so forth may be responsible. We also know too that there were some issues as it relates to the market and cold, sto cold storage and that a number of fishermen did not report the catch to the Ministry of Fisheries and they sold a lot of it on the wayside. Only this week, someone who is in the business of importing fish from Grenada, a company from Canada, came down to speak to the exporters of our fish and to the fisheries officer to point out the uniqueness of the market and some training needs and some areas that will help our fishermen to understand the importance of cultural practices and the handling of fish that will ensure that we continue to enjoy good prices and able to sell um, top quality fish. So the, the, the fishing sector and that department understand the importance of that issue. And they are taking very seriously those issues in seeking to address the issue of the decline in the export of our fishes. We have also seen growth in the vegetable and fruit section, subsector of um, the Ministry of Agriculture. People say, indeed, Grenada is a blessed place. As you move around Grenada, indeed, you can find lots of food. Some years ago, we were importing bananas. Now we are back to self-sufficiency. And we're now looking to see what we can do with the export market. So for us, the agriculture sector would continue to be an importer. And as we continue to marry that sector with technology in terms of the processing aspect, so we have seen the ministry give support to the Cocoa Association for the establishment of another chocolate plant in Grenada. And that is part of the government's vision to ensure that we do not continue forever to export cocoa in bags, but that you will have chocolate from Grenada and other substances. So we understand that pretty well. Mr. Deputy President, as we look at the agriculture sector and we look at the way forward, as I've said, in 2012, one of the things done really is to increase the budget and the allocation for the farm labor support program by 76% because we understand that it provides job, jobs, but at the same time, it helps the sector to grow and to develop. As we look at the propagation program, as I said before, in 2011, approximately 160,000 plants were propagated. We had 40,790 cocoa plants, 25,763 nutmeg plants, 39,947 banana plants, we had 53,495 other crops, including avocados, citrus, mangoes. And we also had 42,050 imported tissue culture plantlets at Maran Station. So we very much understand that we need to provide our farmers. They are activated, they want to plant more, but we must ensure that they have plants. An area that has made great stride 
Mr. Deputy President, is the habilitation of the government control estates. Undoubtedly, we have seen some development there. And the development began successfully in implementing a short-term plan for the estates. We have planted over 15 acres of bananas and five acres of nutmeg. We have re rehabilitated over 10 acres of cocoa plants. And perhaps the most significant thing, that in 2007, the revenue from those estates was a paltry $147,261.99 in 2010. But in 2011, our income was $378,711.30. I think that is an improvement, is a step in the right direction. And given the plans that they are implementing, we can safely say that we expect the government estates to hold its own. And sooner or later, we would not be subsidizing that particular sector. Just briefly, the way forward for agribusiness in 2012, as I said, we have named 2012 the year of nutmeg and other spices. What we'll be doing is basically go on a massive replanting drive. 700 acres of nutmeg and other spices in key areas would be replanted in communities such as Brudge Grove, St. David's, Hermitage, and others. We'll mobilize our schools and everybody to participate in this effort. We also expect very soon, with the coming to being of the Agriculture Farm Roads Program, that it will encourage and enhance the farmers' work, give them greater access to the field. The ministry have also taken on the question of institutional strengthening, and we now have a marketing officer on board. But we also recognize that what we need to do in that particular ministry, because a lot of the extension officers have given 20 years and so of service, and some of the fisheries officer. And one of the things the opposition spoke about the wage bill. What I can say to them is that we are currently conducting an almost complete sum phase of it, a human resource audit that will tell us areas and sectors that are overload and underload, and we will take the appropriate steps to improve where we need to improve in terms of training persons so that they themselves can enhance skills, but we will address the issue as we see it appropriate. So this government understands the need and the challenges that we face. We are operating in not usual times, unusual times. And every housewife in this country knows that you need to be creative as you put a budget together. And let me speak to one aspect. This budget is not about Nazim Burke, and it's not about one or two persons. But indeed, every person had an opportunity to participate and make a contribution as far as the budget presentation is concerned, despite what others may say. They had an opportunity to come up with anything that is creative. If you will allow me, Mr. Deputy President, I just want to say a word on the whole issue of the financial gap, because that has been the other drum that the opposition have been beating over the last few days. It is no doubt, and it is very clear, that even the great United States of America, and, and countries, thank you, Mr. Deputy President, they too are experiencing budget deficit. Countries that are much more powerful than us, they too are experiencing budget deficit and financing gap. So the financing gap is not unusual. It was a hallmark of the previous regime. 
we have that problem as well. The Minister of Finance said that he could not of all of the measures that have been taken. I know myself that we are currently negotiating with some friends at the bilateral level because one of the things that will be mounting is a drive with friendly countries to mobilize resources. And because of the sensitive nature and where we are with some of these negotiations, we cannot speak, I choose not to speak at this time because we have not completed those negotiations. But within the next weeks and months, the public of Grenada, you see, information is timely, and you have to be strategic. There are things you could say today, there are things you must say tomorrow. Because we know in this world, the partisan kind of politics that you have in, on shows like ours is not a question where we have national consensus and everybody decide to work together. People looking at the five-year span of an election, so they're looking to undermine you too because they want to get there to hold the post again. So there are things that it is not timely to share. So you look at the Mount Hartman project. I could safely say with all certainty that I believe that we have sourced the majority of the funding for that particular project. And that project will come on stream sometime. And that we have outlined a number of projects under the major projects, if you look at them carefully. In other words, this government, do the new projects that we are preparing now is because we know that government is continue, continue, continuous. And because we know we should not only prepare for ourselves and be selfish. Preparing projects now that may come into fruition in the next maybe five, six years. And I say this because we have about 12 projects that money has already been secured to the tune of over $300 million. And that what we are looking to do now is to secure some counterpart funding, and that is where the drive, as far as the bilateral arrangement, is for them. So if you look at the, the OPEC, the OFID projects for many of our schools, I can say to you that in all honest, we expect work on those projects to start boots on the ground by the last quarter of this year. And there are some projects that will begin in next month or two as it relates to the Granville Secondary and the St. Joseph in St. George. I can safely say to you that when we look at the St. John's River project and we look at the St. Patrick's Road project, that based on where we are with these projects, that some work will begin, not just the design stage, but some work will begin coming towards the latter part of this year. So the people of Grenada need to have hope that sometimes in putting a budget forward, you may not be able to respond to every single little need at this moment, but you have to look at the wider picture. That in the final analysis, that these projects will create jobs. And the economic growth that we're speaking about with certainty in 2012 will come from this area and we'll see an improvement in the construction sector and the creation of jobs in those sectors. And we will find some money to narrow the financing gap. I'm sure as daylight that it would happen. We can safely say, as we look at this budget, that we have had no new taxes on the backs of the poor. And by adding no new tax on the backs of the poor, it means we have not increased the poverty level, but we have all, by not adding new taxes on the private sector itself, it means that we are not stifling the growth expansion. And this is something that we have not been given credit. It, it, it was very tempting 
to find revenue and to say we must come up with new taxes in order to get some more money. We have not cut on the social programs as it relates to the safety net programs. Two minutes more. So, in conclusion, I have no doubt that while we live in very difficult times, while our economy will continue to be sluggish, as recovery on the international level will continue to be sluggish, but that the management of it, which is important in terms of how we manage the little resources that we have, is qualitatively different from what occurred in the past. And had it not been for the recklessness of the past, for example, when we speak about $40 million that we may have to put as far as um, paying debt, if you remove from that those sovereign guarantees that went to the projects in Livera, the Garden Group Hotel, the Chicken Farm, and all those other areas, it may well have been $20 million. And that other $20 million may have assisted in narrowing the financing gap and creating more jobs for the people of Grenada. So this, they are indicted as well. They spent 13 years there without putting a framework, without putting the necessary infrastructure that will facilitate growth and development. So when you get a shock, everything collapse. We are changing that. We are investing in those sectors that will get us out there. They have been reckless in the way they treat the economy. And together with the structure that we inherit and the global financial crisis and their recklessness have us in this pit. If you look at all of the countries that uh, are doing no, well. Unfortunately, I think you've <clears throat> exhausted your time. Thank you very much, Mr. So Deputy I will just, President. I'll just allow you the privilege to conclude in a, yes. in a logical way, but your time is... I was basically pointing out to Mr. Deputy President that the countries that are growing and doing better, like China and India, they are doing so because they had long-term strategic planning. They identified the sectors and niche areas that will allow them, and they invested in those sectors. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm concluding on the point that I make. And so this is why we, have invest, we are investing today in those sectors. We have identified the niche, the vehicle that will take us out there. So in conclusion, I would say that I support this budget unwaveringly. Thank you.